Greetings from Amsterdam and welcome to the hundreds of you tuning in from around the world. My name is Jauri Doeleman. I'm a partner at Antler Netherlands and I am so glad that you are here with us today. As a reminder, Antler is a global early stage venture capital firm that enables and invests in the world's most exceptional individuals. In the spring of 2019, we launched our first founder cohort here in Amsterdam. And today's event is the demo day for our second cohort. In January 2020, 69 founders from over 30 countries came through our doors and started building their businesses together with us. Over a period of 11 weeks, that is the pressure cooker program of Antler, these individuals formed highly complementary teams, validated their business ideas and pitched their world changing companies to our investment committee. In March, the investment committee decided to make six new investments. And it is with great pride that I'm unveiling these six companies to you and the world today. The six companies we invested in out of the second Antler Netherlands cohort are Atium, a company redefining the future of work by building human connections in remote teams through interactive team building exercises. Promore, a SaaS platform that automates corporate procurement to save millions through their machine learning algorithm. Superfin, a fintech company that provides fast capital to SaaS startups. Trabotics, an agritech hardware and IoT company that makes organic farming profitable through labor automation. Vellum, a prop tech company whose software platform allows property developers to maximize the value of their building sites from the earliest stages. And last but not least, Zopnik, an Indian company that connects local boutiques to women hosting pop-up show events at home. Today is your chance to meet these companies before the rest of the world, to have the first conversations, provide advice, make meaningful introductions and express your interest to invest, or to have follow-on conversations after today's event. Here's how it works. Below, you can see the individual startups. You can then click get in touch to register your interests. Or if you prefer, you can just sit back and watch each team's pitch video one after the other by staying on this page. If you signed up to join any of the private Q&A sessions with the startups, you should have received links to those Zoom webinar rooms in a separate email from us. The Q&A sessions will begin very shortly. Thank you again for being a part of Anther Amsterdam and showing your support for our startups. We are truly amazed by the progress that these teams have made in just a few months. And we hope you're as excited as we are for the journey that lies ahead. So without further ado, let's dive right in. For remote teams, the number one unsolved problem is fostering a sense of connection. What happens very naturally in an in-office environment, for example, going to the coffee machine and having a short chat or having that chat before a meeting, is very hard to do remotely. There are three critical aspects to remote work, communication, coordination and culture. For communication and coordination, there are already some great tools and processes in place. But for culture, there isn't really yet a great platform that helps remote teams. Atium wants to be the platform that builds culture for your company. We want to be the platform that people think about when they think about remote work and culture. And we really want to be there from day one. So Atium's solution is to really build the social fabric of remote teams. We do that in three ways. One is helping teams schedule their rituals with social moments. Second is engaging them with activities. And third is then reflecting that back to basically close the loop. With scheduling, we help teams to make it really easy to actually create a habit around building a social connection in their teams. We connect to the rituals that they already do, the moments they already have during the week and during the month, and add a little bit of social connection during those moments. And secondly, those moments we inject with activities. Activities from having an energizer that makes the meeting a little bit more interesting, coffee chats where people can build a real deep connection and get to know each other deeply, to team building events where teams can practice collaboration and share vulnerability. Lastly, we measure both engagement in the platform as well as active reflection through questions, how the team is doing, like how happy are they, how connected are they, and reflect that back to leadership and HR. Our product stands out in two core ways, rhythm and really engaging experiences. 
Firstly, we ensure a regular rhythm in the teams, because relationships don't build up with one-off events. It requires consistency, repetitivity, and intentionality. It's like building a muscle. If you train it a lot, it becomes stronger. So in an organization, a team becomes stronger on, over time. And the second part is to make it engaging for the teams. For every social moment that teams have, anything that uh, a team does, we want to provide engaging activities so that they can build a human connection. The market is huge. Already before Corona, a lot of people were working remotely. Although this is, of course, a social, uh, health and even economic crisis, it has helped a lot of companies and individuals realize that remote work is a possibility. Right now, we're looking at projections of a 700% increase after lockdown measures lift. That means that um, by the end of 2020, more than 48 million people will be working remotely. They will all have this problem of building a connection in their team, and that's where we step in. It's been really surprising to find out how many people relate to the problem that we're solving. There is a huge number of people that we speak to, both company owners or um, employees, that really see the benefits of remote work, but the thing that is preventing them from working remotely is the fear that they will lack this human connection with their coworkers. So what we've learned is that Atium can not only be a good solution for teams that already work remotely, but it can also really be a way to democratize access to remote work for people that wish they could work remotely. Our business model is simple. We have a subscription model where remote teams pay us on a monthly basis to build and nurture their culture within their company. The way we do it is we'll convince team leads to add our app to their workspace with the goal to actually create a habit loop there. Once we've been successful with that, they'll go to the premium plan and we'll convince leadership to roll this out to the rest of the company. In our first early stage tests that we ran up until the end of June, we were able to get over 1,500 people to use the platform and connect with their co-workers. We've been able to validate both demand and acquisition and we can now really focus on improving the product. In particular, we're excited to build some behavioral loops that will allow users to come back to the platform and really start building a habit out of building human connections in their remote workspace. As we're filming this in July, we're about to launch our beta product. It will have a seamless integration with Slack and we will have 50 companies that will be our beta pilot testers. They will pay a reduced fees in exchange for providing us with feedback. And some of the largest fully distributed companies in the world are actually showing interest in the pilot. In one year from now, our objective is to have found product market fit. We really think that this product has a viral component to it. Through word of mouth and referrals, we're gonna be able to really get an exponential curve in our growth. Uh, we're really excited about that, both for uh, the future of our company, but also because of the positive impact that that can have on remote organizations around the world. As a team, we're really driven to solve this problem for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we've all been team leads in our previous experiences, and we really noticed how important it is to build culture. Secondly, we all had some experiences or strong interest in remote work. This makes us the right people to solve the problem because we've experienced it firsthand. And at the same time, we also have the right skill sets in order to solve it. We have Yanis that aside from being the best software uh, engineer I've ever worked with, also really has a very strong business mindset. So can also uh, think critically in terms of uh, what features make sense and which ones don't and how to prioritize. We have Hido that has a huge experience in product development. He really brings a lot to the table in terms of uh, understanding the user. And finally, I bring to the table my experience in growth, uh, really thinking in a data-driven way about how we can get those first 10, 100 customers and then really scale it up. Are you a remote team or do you know somebody working in a remote team? Then please try out our product. We'll have a special offer for people watching today at atm.app slash demo day. We're also raising a round currently, so if you're interested, please reach out. Not only do we have the, the different skills that are very well balanced, also we work very well together. And most importantly, we've all been team leaders and we are super excited to make sure that teams can work great together.
procurement tools and processes are super outdated and slow, and people are just drowning in this manual, tactical job. Four out of five deals are not negotiated and overpriced, which means that every year, globally, businesses lose $2 trillion because of bad procurement. And there is two main reasons why this is happening. First of all, the procurement doesn't have enough resources to manage every deal in the company. And second, business really don't want to engage with the procurement because the process is so frustrating and so slow, they want to avoid it at any cost. And that leads to more than 30% of deals not negotiated, not the during this made, and that leaves money on the table. And we're here to fix it. We built a B2B SaaS tool that uses power of machine learning to automate and digitize procurement. We take historical data of the companies, we analyze and classify it, and then we let machine learning algorithm go through all of this and come up with recommendations to enable business stakeholders and procurement people make informed decisions in seconds. This idea came from this feeling of hopelessness and frustration. When I realized I have word strategic in my job title, I talk about digital transformation every day, and yet, I spend 80% of my time collecting and comparing Excel. When you buy, let's say, a chair or a laptop commodity, in other words, you have a list of criteria that help you to make a decision. When you buy marketing or transportation services, this list becomes huge. And that's why making decision takes a long time. Our competitors are focused on commodities and we have the domain knowledge and technical expertise to build a tool that will help buying procurement of services. Yeah, so there is for sure a few players on the market already that do procurement analytics, but they mainly focused on the goods procurement. And goods procurement is straightforward, but the services are different, they're more subjective and complex, and you need a lot of data to analyze this. And that's where the machine learning helps the most, because we get all this data, crunch through this, and get the insights in seconds instead of weeks of analysis. For seven years that I've been doing procurement, it's been heartbreaking to see that uh, I spend my time just collecting and comparing Excel. And Dennis, when he was doing his PhD in system analysis, had exactly the same feeling about inefficiencies. We had quite some chats during Anthro program and then we realized we share the same passion to change the world and make things more efficient so people can do fun and strategic stuff. Now is the perfect timing because business admits that they have a problem and they're looking for the solutions, but still more than 60% of the teams don't use any tools. And now there is only a few players in the market. The market size is 1.7 billion, but in three years it will be 4.3 billion and about 80% of the team will already have a solution. So it's now or never. We digitize uh, procurement processes and operations. And as a result, we save not only time of people, but also millions of dollars. All of this information is in our system. Therefore, we can capture the savings and then we charge 3% of delivered savings, which brings us to $300,000 of revenue per client per year. And why it works? Because the procurement departments actually want to get more savings because they get the bonuses and salaries based on these savings. And they actually help us to be inside the company, to cover more deals and to earn more savings for them. As of today, in July, we have more than 350 leads in our sales pipeline. We had more than 100 interviews with procurement leaders. We built our MVP and we are now negotiating two paid pilots with global enterprises. We've been quite busy. When I came in Antler, this was like 70 people and worked with almost everyone in the program, but it didn't click. But then we met with Gala, we started to discuss the procurement and how it works and what it is and the market size. And while we talk, it's clicked that we have complementing soft skills. She had a lot of energy and passion about this. And I'm more logical and structural and like cold-minded. And we also have hard skills matching. We are the team where the match was made on heaven. We are complementing each other with Dennis on the soft skills. He is very analytical and structured and I like to talk to people and make the corner softer. But also I bring the domain expertise in procurement. I have a rich network and I am a colleague, not a salesperson for our clients. Dennis is a serial entrepreneur. He's been leading teams in startups. He had his own startup for two years and he is an expert in machine learning. By the end of this year, we are planning to close two paid deals with customers. And although this is going to prolong our runway, 
In November, we are looking for $250,000 as an investment. Our focus is on the product and on sales. We need this money to hire an additional sales lead, follow up by a product engineer. It's very difficult to make forecasts in this economical situation, but we are aiming to have four paying clients and five pilots in our pipeline by the end of next year, which brings us to half a million of revenue that was our original goal. So our vision is to finally solve these frustrations as a corporate, because from my academic background, there's a huge amount of bureaucracy and people really struggle. They just do this paperwork or repetitive work instead of focusing on what matters and just spend their lives just going and grinding for data. Our grand vision is to revolutionize procurement and the industry. We want to make sure that procurement becomes a strategic partner and not a cost-cutting department. Our main focus today is to get as much data as possible. That's why we have diversified our approach and we are now talking to small and medium-sized companies. So if you know anyone in charge of a small or medium-sized company, please bring them our way. We would love to talk to them. Both myself and Dennis started to work when we were 20 years old. And looking back, it's just painful to see how much time been spent doing stupid operational stuff just because it's been done this way instead of learning something new. We want to change it. We want to make sure that people focus on strategic and fun stuff. And the rest is done by machine learning. During my time in venture capital as well as an entrepreneur, I realized a lot of the issues that entrepreneurs face during fundraising. So entrepreneurs get diluted down to 10% by Series D. They give up a huge amount of value and control in the process. In addition to that, entrepreneurs have the chicken and egg problem. So they first have to raise the funding in order to show the right metrics to investors. And it also takes a really, really long time in order to raise funding. Sometimes it can take more than six months Superfund aims to solve these problems by providing instant revenue-based funding for recurring revenue startups. And we're also looking at an invoice discounting product that can help these startups to fundraise. What we see is a massive opportunity to protect founders with their innovative product. Instead of losing the control of the company, we share the risk with them and then we focus our, on their revenue to grow. Not only we protect them from the dilution, we give them the opportunity to get better metrics, as well we, we guarantee them a really fast financing, which can facilitate their growth and they can ship the time they spend on fundraising towards the product. The SaaS market is absolutely massive. It's growing from around $300 billion in 2019 to over $600 billion in 2023 at a compound annual growth rate of 18%. Right now, there's the perfect mix of factors. It's never been easier to start off a SaaS or recurring revenue business. In addition to that, COVID has hit. So in economic recessions, valuations for companies usually decline. It's not the ideal time to raise venture capital. And so entrepreneurs need to look to other forms of funding. Uh, in addition to that, we're tapping into the Antler network and that network is growing with over a thousand entrepreneurs right now. We see some competitors focusing on, on specific regions or uh, some are focusing on short term and uh, we see the opportunity to focus on short term and long term. We are also seeing the opportunity to develop a platform as a service. The other factor is the, the, the process speed that we aim to, to put in place with our algorithm. We are also building an intelligence tool aiming to help founders make funding decisions between equity and revenue-based funding and provide those insights through the data that we collect. Our business model varies on the, the risk level of the company that we assess. That can go from 5% up to 40%. And depending on that uh, same risk, we define the amount of revenue we share with them that can go between 2% up to 10% of their monthly recurring revenue. We incorporated in June, July. During these last two months, we've built a pipeline of over a thousand clients. And right now we're working with four clients. We're compiling four case studies. 
So I have around 17 years of experience in finance. I was the CFO at the venture capital family office uh, where I dealt with startups and had first-hand knowledge of the issues that entrepreneurs face. Before that, I have a host of investment banking experience, including experience in credit, which is very relevant to the Superfin business. Carlos has six years of fintech experience. He worked on data architecture, which is very similar to what we're using in Superfin. In addition to being finance professionals and having finance experience, we also ran our own startup. So we have first-hand knowledge of how difficult it is to raise funding, as well as the problems that entrepreneurs have it was incredible to experience the Antlers framework and to put us uh, in touch very early on. It was perfect. We met right at the beginning of the program. Antler had arranged a scavenger hunt where we had to solve certain challenges. Uh, we worked quite well during that challenge. We were the last team to leave the building because we planned our route really well and we ended up winning that challenge. So uh, I realized that we would work very well together. Uh, during the Antler program, we started off looking at financing solutions in the SME industry. Uh, we pivoted based on data. Because of our experience with startups and our experience in the finance world, we were aware of revenue-based funding. It's existed for quite a while. We realized that it can be automated using open banking. And because of that, uh, we, we started testing this idea with founders within the program we realized that it solves a lot of the funding issues that they've been having in the past. And uh, based on that feedback, we eventually came up with Superfund. Well, it's been really surprising to us the, the perception that founders have about revenue-based financing, perhaps based on, on the prior knowledge they have about loans. But this model has been in, in the market for quite a long time already, and uh, they are not aware yet about the space, although this is very founder-friendly. For those that have heard of revenue-based funding, they don't understand how it works. So a lot of them think that it's like debt. I think that there's still a certain market knowledge that needs to take place in order to educate people about the product. We have a really bold uh, vision for, for this company because we, we dream to revolutionize every single fundraising round for, for startups and to, to make founders focus on what they do best is to build innovative products and not spending the time on fundraising and been catching the right investor. So in a year's time, we will have around 30 clients and we would have raised a loan book, which should be uh, more than $25 million. In terms of vision, we would like to take a holistic approach, you know, from cradle to grave of a transaction, of a funding transaction. We would like to solve all of the problems that entrepreneurs have. We couldn't be more excited about this because if we really think about this type of model, it's really founder friendly. And uh, the fact that founders can ship the focus from fundraising those long periods of time towards the building of their products, that could be a game changing for the quality of the of startup products. We want to play a role in changing the financial landscape for entrepreneurs. Uh, we believe that revenue-based funding is going to form an important part of the finance stack uh, looking forward in, in the near future. Uh, because of our time as entrepreneurs, uh, and our time in finance, we realize the issues that entrepreneurs face and we want to play an active role in solving those issues. When you look at the startup world, we basically funding innovation and that innovation makes the world a better place. More and more people, they want to eat healthy vegetables, resulting in strong EU regulation to push for more organic food. 25% of all vegetables need to be organic by 2030, and they're taking out a lot of pesticides. So what that means for a farmer is that they have to change their traditional way of business into a non-pesticide way of farming. But when we started interviewing them, we quickly figured out there's only one thing on their mind. Somebody needs to do the weeding. When you look at a farming process over the year, they spend most of their time actually taking care of the crops. And especially in the months April, May, June, they have to do a lot of weeding. And organic farmers are not allowed to use pesticides and they have to use expensive outside labor to do the job for them. 
It is so expensive that it costs them 750 euro per hectare each time they do it. Our solution is an autonomous robot that takes out the weeds up to one centimeter close to the plant. It's fully autonomous, it covers three to five hectares per day and reduces the amount of manual labor with 75%. We estimate that in a five year time span, it will be a 60% cost reduction for a farmer. We also make sure that the robot checks how good he is doing the work. So a farmer doesn't have to check upon the robot, but just at the end of the day, he gets a message to his phone that tells the performance of the weeding of the robot. So if we look into this from a technology perspective, we are quite confident that the main building blocks for fully automated and autonomous robots, such as machine learning, automation, uh, activation system, uh, is matter enough. And we could bring like a lot of you know, blocks together to make uh, an automation system uh, that is smart, that is connected and really benefits the farmer. This is a fairly new market. There are only a few players and we really see a, a last mover advantage to take the market as it's just starting to grow. We're looking at a 20 billion market by 2025. With 800,000 farmers in the EU, that means a lot of potential robots. And just selling a thousand would put us north of 50 million euro in revenue. Our business model is quite straightforward. We sell a robot with 50% margin, and on top of that, add additional services. For instance, nighttime driving, performance monitoring, remote maintenance. In the end, we see ourselves as an IoT platform that are the hands and eyes of the farmer. We would like to think about ourselves as a software company. In the future, we're gonna be more focusing on uh, building like more uh, software packages that you could deploy either on our own built hardware or on third-party devices. While the competition, uh, especially startups, because there is no big player uh, you know, so far in this market, they think about themselves like more as a hardware company. So they insource uh, everything and they focus too much on the hardware, on building the mechanical frame and that would cost them a lot of money while for us our robot is light, you know, we outsource the manufacturing so we can focus on the software side. After we did the initial interviews in March, we already got a lot of positive feedback from the farmers. They are dying for us to build this robot and there were already two farmers that signed up for a pilot. By the time you're watching this video, uh, we will already be trying our robot in the field uh, with our two pilot customers. In the short term, like we're going to push uh, the robot from prototype to MVP while we focus more and more on the cloud ecosystem. We would love to talk with more farmers uh, so we could understand uh, their needs in order to build a better product. Mohammed comes from a 10-year aerospace background and made complex systems before. On my side, I have a 10-year deep tech commercial background, moved to the US and bootstrapped an EV charging company from zero to three million euros in revenue. What binds us well together is that we're both down-to-earth guys that care about this problem and want to move, push this industry forward. I think the dynamics are quite good. Uh, our visions uh, were quite clear, like we know each one's responsibilities. I have to build the robot and team have to sell it. I think we quite complement each other, me on the technical side and team like on the commercial sales, sales side. Doing the interviews with farmers, we're really surprised how big this weeding problem is. And we really figured out that not a lot of people actually listen to farmers and what they need. One of the best experiences so far are the conversations that we've had with the farmers, just having a cup of coffee and listening to what they need. As a next step, because we are in robotics and, in, and do, trying to do something good for agriculture, there's a lot of free subsidy money available. So in the next three months, we're trying to get up to a quarter million euros in subsidy money to fuel our R&D developments. Weeding is just one of the first problems that we're trying to solve. While we see a wave of automation in agriculture, with the robots on the field, we want to be on the forefront of that wave so that we as people eat healthy, healthy vegetables, we live in balance with the land and the farmer has a decent living wage. The irony is that I never thought I would end up building uh, products that has to do with farming. My grandfather used to take me and my brother to one of the farms. At that time, like the farm was like, very alive. You smell like this fresh, you know, uh, air. That same farm today, when we drive past it, uh, it's totally dead. And I asked my uncle, why, why you're not working on the farm anymore? And the answer was like, it's more and more difficult to find labor. And from that point, I started thinking about like, how could I solve at least a small part of the problem? And the solution for that is actually like, to help automate and more and more the farming uh, experience. One year from now, we would love to deliver our robot to our first few customers. And that these farmers trust the robot enough to cancel outside labor and fully depend on our robot for weeding. I would love to talk to a farmer, look at the field, while we're both sipping a glass of wine and see the robot do the weeding job for him.
the real estate industry is lagging far behind in digital transformation, property developers, when they carry out their feasibility studies, are doing it literally on the back of an envelope and at best on Excel sheets. So this is a very manual, iterative, time-consuming and traditional way, which has to keep pace with the current way that things are moving. Vellum helps property developers minimize risk and save time at the early stage of property development by enabling them to carry out rapid feasibility studies to help them reach the maximum value of a building site with greater speed and accuracy. Our solution focuses on three main steps, generate, test and analyze. So users start by generating designs based on regulations and the customized input, where they can then rapidly test out the different options. And finally, they can analyze their business case all in real time. We want to target the very early stage where the ability and even the imperative of being able to impact the cost is much greater. We want to be able to make strategic decisions proactively instead of retrospectively, which reduces a lot of abortive costs. Cities are growing at an exponential rate. By 2050, 2.5 billion more people will be living in cities. 13,000 buildings are going to be constructed daily, and all of these are going to be subject to more and more regulations. And if we want to be able to keep pace with this immense growth, we need to do something very fast. In the Netherlands alone, there are about 1,000 property development firms. If you would ask about 1,000 euro per firm, that would make our total market in the Netherlands about 12 million. If you extrapolate that globally, then we're looking at a total addressable market of about 7 billion. So what you see is that a lot of startups have entered the space that we're in. The, the way that we're different is that we are putting the perspective of the property developer first, which is focused a lot on profitability and risk. One surprising thing we learned is that property developers are humans too. So basically coming from the background of an architect who was setting out to solve problems for architects, uh, we realized that property developers also have problems and this came from interviews with over 40 property developers where we realized that it was not just about money and square meters and efficiencies and it was really about carrying out their jobs and we really wanted to help them do their jobs better in a more efficient way. Quite in a cliched way actually how ideas come about. I basically burned two weekends uh, going through a revision that the client had already signed off on. The marketing team had basically decided to change their unit sizes and we had to spend time redrawing and recalculating every single plan. And this was done in a very manual way. So I started looking for ways in which I could do this in a better and quicker way. And as I started doing my research and speaking to other practitioners, we, I realized that there were very few solutions in the industry. And I thought, why not try to create a solution that could address a problem that not only I was facing, but the rest of my peers. I was really amazed by how archaic some of these property development processes currently go. And I think there's a major opportunity here to really revolutionize this space. So we're currently onboarding our first launching customers and our goal for this year is to have 10 clients in total. In one year, we'll have our first 20 customers and we'll already be well on our way of revolutionizing the way this market operates. We have a software as a service business model and depending on the duration of the contract, you can get a discount on your total price. This whole operation kind of got started in, uh, in April and as of today, uh, July, we're very pleased to tell you that we signed our first paying launching customer, which we're obviously very, very pleased about. Since we have a steady stream within our pipeline, we're fairly confident that we can sign a few more launching customers uh, by September. I think one of the things that surprised me the most actually is not, not coming from the real estate industry, is how open and receptive the developers are to what we have to offer. Like most people I talk to are generally interested in what we do I want to engage with us and want to see what we can do for them. Pretty much everybody we talk to say, hey, please stay in touch, keep me updated and keep me in the loop on what you're building because we do see a clear need for this in the future. As a team, we're very driven to solve this problem because it speaks to two very core values that we all have and that is not wasting time and making things better. Eric, who's our CTO, has a background in computer graphics and he spent the last 10 years leading the marketing and product teams in a B2B SaaS company. This means that he's not just a regular coder because he's very strategic about what to code and when to code, which is critical when it comes to our, the fast pace that we're working at. And Leonard, who's a natural salesman. He basically has a passion and aptitude for sales, which he carries out in a very rigorous and yet charismatic way. 
And on my side, I've worked as an architect for over eight years, so I've been very exposed to the, the inner workings and the pains and the problems in the industry. As a team passionate about our built environment, if we have a chance to add value and make our built environment better, there is no reason why we should not do that. When we started with this whole endeavor, the, you know, well, the, the crisis kind of started, and we managed to do everything remote and still kept the, uh, the morale on the team very high, which I think is a testament to how we work. We communicate on a very clear and open basis, and we clearly like working with each other. So uh, yeah, overall, I think it's an amazing team to be a part of. We are looking for beta launching customers, so we would greatly appreciate introductions to property developers in the Netherlands. And with our beta product launch, we will be getting quite a lot of feedback on the features that we need to incorporate in the product. So we need to increase the capacity of our team. And for that, we would like to speak to investors who are interested in this space. Vellum is really going to revolutionize the way property developers carry out their feasibility assessments. Time, opportunity, cost, and even ambiguity are taken out of the equation where they can rapidly carry out feasibility studies at a pace that they want and as many times as they want. We see Vellum as a way to drastically reduce the time and save costs for feasibility studies, paving the way to create better buildings and cities. I'm Fritz, I'm the co-founder of Zopni. So let me first introduce ourselves. My partner Sukmani brings a strong experience in community building. Until recently, she ran her own startup called Better Butter, which she sold it off to a Singapore-based ad tech company. Within just a span of four years, she built a strong community of 3 million users. And before that, she also has a background in consulting and marketing. As for me, I bring 15 years of experience in offline and online retail including last eight years with Jabong, where I was a founding member. I built three key business verticals from scratch and scaled it to over $100 million business. So together, we bring synergies from both community and business building side. So let me set the context here. COVID-19 pandemic has led to a justified fear of public places. Consumers today are afraid to visit the shopping malls and the high street stores, and they have started looking for alternative channels to fulfill their shopping needs. Although we believe that online shopping is fulfilling a part of its need, but it also brings with it its own set of problems like lack of touch and feel, they have issues with fit, leading to a lot of distrust among the consumers. We have also seen a new shopping behavior among the consumers that have emerged in recent times. They have started looking for channels like social selling platforms, including WhatsApp, Facebook and Instagram, and also started attending live streaming events to fulfill these needs. So we have devised a solution which we are calling it Retail 3.0, combining these benefits of offline shopping with an asset light online model. Here, we are introducing a persona called Super Stylist. You can imagine Super Stylist is somebody who is a social influencer or a, or a community leader in a particular neighborhood and she represents Zopni, solving both these problems of offline and online shopping for an end consumer. So, we believe that data science is the heart of our business. So, once we acquire a Super Stylist, we capture her persona and then we try to match those personas to the attributes of her products that she likes through an advanced matching algorithm. So, how does it work? Once we match the products or a brand to the super stylist, we give away a small set of samples to the super stylist. She, in turn, uh, builds a community of hosts. You can imagine host is somebody who is a homemaker, who is willing to do a small tea party at home, willing to do, conduct a live streaming event, sitting in the comfort of their own place, and also willing to sell socially through their social media channels. So on the basis of sales that they generate, Zopnik fulfills those orders for a delivery partner and in return, host as well as the super service earns a commission out of it. And we believe that this particular market is really huge. Overall fashion and lifestyle market is close to $100 billion. Zopnik's customer profiles are the women in the ages of 25 years and above, residing in the urban areas with an average household income of $3,000. And this particular market is close to $20 billion. And we aim to capture at least the minimum of 2.5% of this market, converts to almost half a billion dollars in the next four to five years' time. Our business model is very simple. On every event, on every transaction that we do, we earn 20% commission after giving away 20% commission to the host and the super size. Which means, at every sales of $100 per event, we earn $20 net profit. 
So far, it's just been 20 days of our operation. We have already onboarded 25 super stylists with an average acquisition cost of $3, generating a sales of $100 per super stylist with an ASP of $13. So in next 12 months time, we plan to acquire a minimum of 250 super stylists, generating a sales of $700,000 across four cities that we have identified so far. And to do that, we are looking at raising $2 million funds, which will take care of 18 months of our runway that will be used to build our team, build our product, and also take care of our marketing and operational expenses. So we look forward to discussing this further with you. Thank you.